we have to think because many things actually many times we we battle with fear we battle with um insufficiencies insecurities we battle with failures how do i take the limits off the first thing i like to do is to find out what are the limitations that would constrain my decision we're seeing how and now we're at what so we, 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 we are hitting at something here we're hitting at something here that complexity is different from being complicated just agree on the direction of travel mm. adjust yourselves and move while you're going along you keep adjusting but you the vision will point in the direction of where you're going and that's the critical thing hi um welcome again to the unlearn show i am here with dr fritz spinock aka fritz <laughs> um today we are going to continue the a series that we've been having on complexity and again in case you haven't been noticing this is the segment or session or hour of um, your life or day week month year when we seek to undefine to unlimit unlearn and rethink our ideas it's as simple as that the moment you develop a strong held belief start questioning it start questioning it um, putting it to the test stretching it and see where and how and what flaws exist within it only by doing that and strong reflecting will your processes and ability to make decisions get better and will you understand how limited you are as a person and how vulnerable you are to error and how humble we should be um and it's with that i want to welcome again dr Pinock, how are you doing, sir? I am good, Captain Jamie, a.k.a. Jamie. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. <laughs> no, um, I'm, I, I, we were just talking before we um, started recording briefly on how valuable our connection is um, yes. and how, it, it, how important it is to stand guard by your mind. Um. Mm. As much as your security is important, your safety, the safety of and to, to guard your mind and what you let in and what you choose to spend your time with and on, I believe it's um, extremely important that a lot of emphasis and safety mechanisms are placed to protect your mind. Yes. Burglar bar, yes. alarm system, um, <laughs> all of that is placed on your mind. Um, a security system is there to govern what goes in and what com comes out. And most important, what stays. And on this show, we examine and metal test uh, what stays in. We ask questions and seek to investigate. Is it that what is in our minds ought to be there? Should it be there? Should we unlearn it? And relearn something else. Should we delete it completely, unlearn it completely, and rethink our processes? Mm. Big questions, questions that we'll probably never answer. And I hope we don't, because the moment we answer those questions, then we yes. are done learning. How do you feel about that, Dr. P? <laughs> very, very profound, very profound, Jamie. The moment we feel that we have done learning. And I was just reflecting that. You know, in the Bible, there are 134 verses about mm -hmm. God in your heart. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's referring to the mind. And one of the key verses which keep popping up is Proverbs chapter 4, I think is verse 23, which says, Keep thine heart with all diligence, or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So it's a place mm -hmm. where we process things. The heart. And... All of it comes 
So as you rightly said, the inputs, the ingredients that we put in are important because they determine what comes out of it. So as you rightly said, you know, what we feed in, we have to sift and filter negative energies and negative thoughts as much as possible. You know, because what we process is what will come out. Indeed. Um, the issues of life, as, as, mm. as mentioned in, in the Bible verse, what comes out, out of it comes the issues of life. How yes. do you think about that? Issues of life. What does that mean for you? These are the things that occupy our time and the things that we tend, we process. There's so many things coming at us and it goes right back to the core of what we have started on complexity. Because the more issues we have to process is the more complex the situation becomes. Mm. And uh, one of the days where we had the luxury to process what we choose because there are multiple things coming from multiple dimensions. And how we deal with them, how we prioritize them, how we reprioritize them, how we unlearn, how we unthink. You know, these are, you know, the myriad of things that we have to decide on what is important, as you said, the issues. How do you prioritize? What are important? So we, are, we are processing something and then something else comes along which takes over. And, you know, I mean, reshape our priorities. So it speaks to our ability to be agile, to be flexible. Mm. How to unlearn quickly that what we we're processing just now. It's minuscule compared to the new things that we are going to put there. A new opportunity pops up. Some things happen. You know, life changes. As I said, life do happens. Right. You know, so it's just bringing everything into one day. We are making it complex. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Excellent. The issues of life. So there in your you mentioned that there comes to a point where you now have to decide. If we if we are not deliberate about living, then we will be like a trough in blown and dragged by the wind. Um just yes. like a, a paper in the wind. Wherever the wind takes us, that where we'll that's where we'll go. And sometimes um, you know, if if we allow the mind to to go it can go to exciting places but um yes. if it is that we don't develop and harness what is within the mind because what goes in sort of determines what is there but also how we develop what is there how we work on what is there and also filters what com comes out so i mean the process is is sort of a continuous loop you know in process out in process out um but a part of that loop that we probably um pay less attention to is what is deleted right um what is is sort of um changed inside the mind what the connections that are made, the 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 li the neural links that are formed, and one of the major ones that we find important is decision. And yes. at some point in time, you uh, you just mentioned the word you will have to decide. How do you mm. decide what's important for you and what you will think about in this complex world? Wow. How do you make that decision? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a very deep and relevant question. How do you decide? And decisions, we have to think, because many things actually, many times, we, we battle with fear. We battle with um, insufficiencies, insecurities. We battle with failures. We have so many different mm. stimulants coming at us that's affecting our decision-making process. That if we are not deliberate about it, what you're saying, Jamie, we have to be deliberate about, about our decision-making processes because many times decisions can be made just strictly out of emotions. And we have to try and balance and sometimes bring more data into our decisions, you know, to make it more objective. 
to make it more process oriented as opposed to we just hit a decision make a decision and it's out of feelings that a lot of times we can make wrong decisions or decisions we end up to regret and as i said because life is so much more complex we require input from other sources such as data you know that we're not just purely out of feelings so as i said the decision making process is something that we have to be deliberate about to be sort of structured that we bring some rigor to it hmm. you know when, to sort when you're of, making a decision yes go ahead when you're making a decision what what's the fear that you have what are one of the fear that 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 sort of um acts as a um a part of the complex process that you have in making your decisions well again the dimensions from which decisions are make is are made is very important because i like to bring as much as possible my decision making process in the realm of being creative in the realm of not being afraid to change in the realm sometimes of being disruptive so my decision making process are not constrained i try to bring it beyond what we perceive as limits because many times what we see as limits they are our biggest opportunities to move beyond them so we tend to minimize this space in which we operate because fear can drive us in that realm mm. so the first thing i like to do is as much as possible how bold can this decision be mm. not afraid sometimes to go well you know it's not the norm i like to make decisions in those realms in other words sometimes we win and sometimes we learn right not not fear of not fearful of failure mm-hmm. um and i know you're like that too jamie <laughs> <laughs> right i mean i am i'm i'm sort of listening and learning from you um so it's a question you 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 have a decision to make a complex decision in an uncertain world so you're faced with uncertainty and you have complexity to deal with and the first thing you do is ask yourself a question how bold can this decision be or at least that's a part of your process how do you define the boldness D- double click on that for me let's dive a little bit deeper into how bold a decision can be how do you think about boldness in that respect boldness yes how can my decision that i'm going to make change things tremendously not just for me but even disrupt the environment in which I'm in. I'm not afraid to enter those spaces so it's um how do I take the limits off the first thing I like to do is to find out what are the limitations that would constrain my decision what are the those constraints and I like to how to rethink unlearn <laughs> hmm. you know those hmm limits i like to challenge where the fears are why the question why 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 haven't others thought of this why not try something different because as you said complexity is not linear because we tend to sometimes bring a linear approach to a complex situation one plus one equal, does not equal two complexity we are not managing inputs but we are trying to maximize outputs and mm. if you are output focus in other words there's no special formula for the input to get the output that we want but many a times is the that sizzle that we bring to making that steak <laughs> mm. don't be afraid very, very. to be unique yeah very very interesting go ahead very interesting um and I, I mean there's a lot of things that i want to 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 sort of dive into um because you mentioned some hot topics so <coughs> this is sort of super interesting super super interesting where um the first question is how bold can this decision be right um and you think of boldness in a way where 
it's about disruptive and impact, disruptiveness and impact um, to the environment. And the second question, the second thing you ask yourself is another question, right? Is what are the limitations and constraints? So we're seeing how and now we're at what. So we, 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 we are hitting at something here. We're hitting at something here. I'm picking up a trend. How and what are the limitations and constraints that are already existing? Right? Um, how do you find out? What's your investigative investigative process now that you kind of go into to find out the what are the limitations, the what question? Yes, the what questions. It's... Um, l- l- let's try to use an example. Let's try to use an example. Let's use CMU. Right? When you arrived at CMU um, and you took a very bold perspective, I was there, I remember. Um, and, you know, the vision um, of getting it from CMI to, to, to CMU um, in, a, in a few years um, and to scale it rapidly, it was, it was the industry was calling for that. How did you find out the limitations of that are currently existing within that, that market space. What was your thought process? Yes. The first thing, looking through the lens of opportunities. It was easy to see the limitations of what existed in academia, in education. People were hung up on qualifications, People are hung up on what you don't have. That you miss the opportunities of what you could be. What you could become. So, if you look within the realm of what you have to produce, you'll never achieve excellence or greatness. You have to go beyond and look outside of resources. Let resources follow you. And you don't follow resources. (laughs) You make your decisions beyond your resources because mm. the big bold decision the big bold visions will attract resources i've never seen resources i've never seen vision fall in resources but resources fall in vision mm. people like to win and as long as you first you have to create it it have to start in your mind that you can see something that is not there before you can before you can convince others to see it and be prepared that 90 percent of the people come on will not see it and will challenge you why it can't be there mm. use a 10 percent resource to change that situation so it's it's a mind game <laughs> it's a chess game mm. that's what life is so you have to decide what what output you want and allow timing to create moves for you. You don't know, but you, but you believe that you can do it. And that's, that's where it starts. Excellent. That's the faith, the faith aspect. So the constraints, yes. looking in the industry and, 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 and basically um, you can see that the, the constraints from the education sector based around qualifications, that was kind of the focal point. And somehow you kind of shifted that whole perspective. And then the next question, the next part of the process that you mentioned is you start to ask yourself why. And Simon Sinek is big on starting with the why. Um, you know, yes. and I, I mean, we'll discuss his work in, in, in another podcast um, for sure. Starting with the yes. why and why change, why continue, why develop. I mean, what was the why in your process at CMU, in CMI at the time? What was the why there? What was your why? And what is your why today? Yes. And my why even had to do with the things that people thought impossible was, why not? I put a knot on the why. (laughs) Why Mm. not? And, you know, the the why was to look beyond where you think you were, but look at the problems that you can solve or the things that you can do. And that was the first thing. How can I move my environment to make it one of relevance? So how can you use education 
to solve some of the national problems. Unemployment. To solve the national problems in discipline. To solve the national problems of how can you use a small country to change a product that can stand among the best in the world. These are some of the things. Why not? Why and why not? So the whys were how to move the needle from zero to 80 in a record time. And to do that, you have to step out of the traditional environment. How do you get into that space? To operate first, you have to win people's confidence, which is not easy, that you want to do this in a way. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you have to believe in something that is not there and lead others through it with you to get to something that you will find along the way. <laughs> it right. requires a level of madness, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit, it's, it's very crazy. It requires a level of crazy. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. If, 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 you're, if, you, if you're not prepared to be mad or be deemed mad or crazy a little bit, you're going to find it challenging. Um, having bold visions <laughs> and, um, and, and creating um, a high impact change. You mentioned yes. complexity is not linear. What do you mean by that? Complex is, complexity is not linear. Because many a times we want an output. We try to define the input to get that output. But um, I think it was something I recall from Boston Consulting Group I was reading. They said um, complexity have increased sixfold since the 1950s. But it translates into a 35 times increase in complicatedness. <laughs> Mm. So, when we start with to increase something, to accelerate the level of complexity, it's going to create some level of complicatedness. That's beyond. So, you have to realize that when you're trying to solve a problem in, in a realm of complexity, you're going to create more problems. But within those problems are hidden opportunities. So, you have to shift from the space that you expect to get the results. To see first more madness, to see first more unstructured operations, and out of that you can pick winners. So there's a level of disjoint. It is like when you plant a seed, the seed first have to die before a new plant can emerge. So mm. that fade process between when you plant the seed and when the seed die. You know, it, it creates something totally different. It creates something totally different. Yeah. I want to ring the bell here. Take the time and ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Um, yeah. I mean, I want to propose this way of thinking or this perspective. That complexity is different from being complicated. Yes. I want to propose a shift in pers perspective towards things that things that we are uncertain of how it works, how to solve it, what the outcome will be. Whenever we are unsure and we are forced to make a decision, I want to propose viewing it through the lens of being complex and not complicated. Why? Yes. And it's 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 a it's a lot to do with semantics. It's a language thing. I believe when we deemed so when we deem something complicated, it challenge our it challenges our point of view, our ability to to view it from different angles, perspective, and to come up with a process into making a decision around it. Because Oh, it's complicated. Let us simplify it. And it, you find that when, when, whenever we, we see things as being complicated, what human beings normally do, we, div we have heuristics or basically shortcuts in our minds that we use to 
to make a decision because it's we we think it's complicated and the heuristic heuristic sides take over and we just make a decision on something that we see and we think okay that's the way to go because it's complicated however if it's complex it doesn't need to be complicated if it's complex issue it warrants a process it warrants a way of thinking about it it warrants not understanding every bit of it or not knowing what the outcome will be it warrants a sort of how to say um an understanding of what it is that we are molding the decision to be and working within that frame so it war warrants framing and making a decision based on a deliberate process because complexity does not always need to be complicated um, very, very well said <laughs> complexity and lin and being linear and driving a large corporation forward how do you sort of balance complexity with simplicity because you cannot really simplify everything because it doesn't work like that some things are just complex how do you create that balance within the vision um take cmi yeah, for very example well said. Very, very well said well many times your roadmap have to depend on first identifying drivers for change you cannot manage them but you can identify them mm. one of the things that come to mind was you see technology playing a big part in what you're doing so what are we going to do is increasing exponentially so how can you use technology to assist you in riding those trends or trajectories you have to look at the various trends in that things are changing so rapidly because from the market standpoint in other words when i'm dealing with a complex situation i like to start from the end or not the beginning inversion i like to start from the output yes inversion that is it jamie i said inversion how can we invert the situation in, in you know i mean to, to see first of all where would i like to go and what are the main trends yes um so i mean in a large organization um balancing complexity with simplicity while communicating a bold vision how do you think about that well a vision needs to be clear because if the vision is complex it will lead nowhere when you have a situation you have to first atomize it break it down into atoms then you pull from that the most important elements and from that you pull the most important element because the more complex the situation the simpler the vision should be and for example what you're about has to be so clear like nike so let's just do it let's do it <laughs> mm. you have something very complex but as you rightly said jamie complex is not complicated mm. and the more complex it is the simpler in defining the direction has to be you give people a direction of motion when they are walking or running trust the power of momentum to increase where you want to go don't define that increase in the direction of travel leave that to momentum leave that to momentum you have to so the you have to be careful to constantly be checking and rechecking the direction you're asking people to travel especially when you're changing direction, you're asking them to go somewhere different where there's no path. And that's part of it too. You're saying, follow me. We're going through the waters. Mm. You're going to ask, where do I put my feet? He said, trust the first step. The second one will take care of itself. That's the sort of process. Where people, oh, I'm going to drown. And you're saying, keep walking. The more you walk, 
is the more buoyancy you'll develop until they start to move on water. Um, in other words, yes, go ahead, please, Jamie. No, I, I'm, I'm going, we're, we, 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 we're entering some rabbit holes now. Let, let's dive. <laughs> let's dive in, right? Um, you mentioned um, something that I feel that we need to unlearn, which in, you, you said that um, let's not define the momentum let's in the direction we are travel le, for ourselves let's leave that up to um the momentum process to decide um how fast we travel how, what, what do you mean by that D dive deeper on that for me many a time people want to know the wind speed that they'll meet they want to know where the potholes will be they want to know all the details but if you dive into these details you're going to miss the opportunity First, just agree on the direction of travel. Mm. Adjust your sails and move. While you're going along, you keep adjusting. But you, the vision will point in the direction of where you're going. And that's the critical thing. Follow your nose in a direction. Follow your nose because while you're moving, there are parts you're traveling that are going to be valleys. While you're going along, it's dark. But keep telling yourself that's not your destination. You're on a journey. You're on a journey. You have to keep encouraging, keep motivating yourself on the journey. Because you're going to find you spend more time going through valleys and tunnels. That if you want to get to the destination so quickly. Just as I said, focus on the process. And keep adjusting the process. Because the obstacles... That will come along will keep increasing they'll keep changing but you just keep adjusting and your main thing is to keep the direction of travel keep the direction of travel keep the vision so often we want to define how fast and when we will arrive it's kind of inherent in our in our construct um to kind of understand when when and it's a valid question we ask when um when are you coming when when can we join when um when you will will you be here when will you go when you will, will you be back when will i when will we get it, the, the question of when is sort of and i think we we are getting a better understanding of the when that we are, we, we we've promised and we are going to discuss is that a lot of questions how what and why can be asked up front, can be sort of understood to a certain level, at least initially. We'll have to unlearn and redefine them that we understand. But they can be discussed, understood, and a process can be created around the other questions. The when, what, where, how. Not the when, the how, what, why, where questions. But the when question. When are we going to arrive? When are we going to reach? Question has to be determined by momentum. And I, and I love that point that you touched on. Leave that up to momentum. That a question that if you try to answer will act as a restraint and as a limit to what momentum can do for you and your team and the system that you're working within. Very well, very well said, Jamie. It's 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 a the when question almost has to be asked at the end. It's a question where maybe that's not the right way of putting it, but it's it's a question that is is if you ask it now, an hour later, it's a different answer. Yes, yes, yes. Because momentum. Go ahead. No, you're right. I'm just agreeing with you. I say it's a moving target. Momentum is e e e excellent. Momentum is a compound thing. One plus one equal four. Yes. So momentum. Leave it up to momentum. I'll leave a lot of the roadblocks, a lot of the problem solving to momentum. Very important principle. Um, and then you you before we we, we dive into momentum, you were at asking people. To take the first step and then 
the second one will follow. But how do you get people to take that first step? And first of all, is the 80 20 rule. Mm. You get 20% of the people to be prepared to do 80% of the work. Because you're going to have many spectators, many visitors. Some won't make it, some will drop off, many will be converted along the way. Don't try to convince them before you start. Let them experience the ride and some will come along. Some will be left in the train station. Some will drop off. But if you try to get all hands on deck before you start, you're wasting your time. It's that 80-20 rule, that 80-20 principle. That 20% will always do 80% of the work. Be prepared for that. That's the first thing. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so... If it is, then that you have 20% of the resources, the people, the belief, the team ready. I'm going to ask this when question now. And that's, when do you make a decision? When do you know it's time to get started? How do you think about that? Well... The longest journey begins with the first step. So, we want to answer a lot of the question before we start. Get the train on the road. Get the train moving. And adjust along the way. Because as long as you're in station, you're going nowhere. Mm. Most of your planning will be done while moving. Because the planning that you'll be doing will be relevant. You can plan so many scenarios that you analyze until you paralyze mm. and you don't move. Right. Move, analyze, and adjust. I believe adjustment is one of the greatest tools that you have in your, in your, in your kit. Use that when I'm, trying, when I'm trying to avoid. Because the greatest destinations need to be traveled where there's no path. <laughs> so you have to go to create a path. In creating a path, many things will come by first-hand discovery. And be agile to adjust. Keep connecting with your strategies. You have to mm. keep reconnecting with your strategies. You have to view technology as a servant and not as a master. You have to focus on the outcomes. These are the some of the things that you have to do. You know, the whole perspective has to change. Excellent. That you expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is this is my understanding of when you say if you're at the train station, you're going nowhere. When you say understanding where you want to go, correct me if I'm wrong. When I look back um, and haven't been on the journey, having been on the journey with you, um, very grateful for you taking me along that with that, uh, throughout that process. I haven't thought about it for a while. It is my understanding that the destination or the vision that you have in itself is constantly evolving. Meaning, yes. people would think that you have it all defined, very clear picture in your mind. And, and sometimes leaders um, tend to want to have that before they move. So that acts as a limiting factor to no movement at all. Because yes. the destination is not clear to them. And, and it's, it's common thought that if you're going to have a vision, the vision needs to be extremely clear in your mind for you to communicate it and i think yes. that's where great leaders separate themselves great leaders not managers great leaders understand that the destination in itself is also constantly evolving and because it's such a bold move and the vision is so bold 
you are sort of creating the destination a- along the way as well because it doesn't yes, exist yes. yes and you come back to the question yes. of if there's nobody around to hear the tree falling does it make noise <laughs> <laughs> it's a fundamental question uh, but it's an existential question meaning a destination if you're mo- moving to a place where it doesn't exist and the move is so bold where it's not red ocean it's blue ocean then yes it has to be created and designed yes if it is not very clear in your mind but you understand the general direction. It's not a precise road, the general direction that you want to move. You don't know how you're going to get there. You're depending on momentum. Great leaders can get people to follow, even if the precise location or destination is not known. Great. And if your destination and location is known, you don't need a vision, all you need is a map. <laughs> right. But you need a vision when you're when you're gonna create something. Mm. You don't know what to expect. You don't. You just know it's bigger than you. It's big. It's huge. And the real value is in the process and not in the in the destination. If you're hung up and headstrong about the destination, you miss the great opportunity to learn, which is in the the process along the way, along the journey. That's the part you have to focus on. And when you enjoy that move, then destination doesn't matter. Wherever you stop, it's so huge. When people see a good destination, you only see a starting point. Mm. As long as you need a destination, there's no need to unlearn, to undefine. But when you make stops, it's an opportunity to refuel, recharge, and go again. Right. Excellent. Excellent. If the emphasis is placed on the process and not the destination, because at the end of the day, there are mo- there almost aren't any destination at all. Yes. It's all a direction. That's correct. Hmm. Interesting. I have to unlearn that as well. <laughs> so we just because you cannot really stop moving because that's correct. then then you die that's correct focus on the process very interesting how do you then get people to move how how do you get people to have that initial leap of faith the 80 20 rule works but that 20 percent how do you arm them as a leader in that situation? Well, the, the first the first thing, you have to first believe in the process that you don't understand and don't know. <laughs> People will follow your passion. You have to be authentic. You have to be doing this with a purpose bigger than you. If it's about you trying to prove a point for yourself, people will not buy into it. When people can see your heart, you have to be, at some levels, vulnerable. Mm. To show that you're doing something that you don't need to do, but something that you're passionate that you need to do it. Because you're doing it for more than you. It's not about you. Your purpose has to be bigger. When you're connected to a purpose, it attracts people. And it attracts many types of people too. So let's not get fooled. Mm. People are going to come on for different reasons and seasons. And you have to see it as a moving train. They'll hop on, they'll hop off at stations. Right. Mm. You're also prepared for that. But be prepared that you are so passionate about it that if you're alone, you'll, you'll move. And there are many parts of the journey that you'll have to move along. And as you get closer to station, you'll see more people join you. But when you leave station and you're in a wide open field, people hop off. 
So you have to guard your heart that you can't be disappointed. It goes back to where we started. You have to understand and give room for people to hop off, to disappoint you, to disappoint themselves, to hop on. That it requires forgiveness along the journey. It requires you to take the blunt, take the pain. It requires you to get comfortable with walking into prickles because there's no part. You are making a part. There'll be potholes, there'll be pit stops. It's part of the journey. And you cannot be discouraged no matter how rough the journey becomes. Because if you are discouraged and you stop, no one will follow you. So, as you say, Jamie, it's a process that keeps adjusting, that keeps changing. There's no destination. <laughs> this idea of destination, we have to rethink. Yes. We, I think we need to come to the drawing board and reframe the idea that we have of a destination. Yes. In itself, it's, it's, it, it's sending uh, the wrong signal. It's sending a signal yes. of completion and final lizing, finishing because it's generally not a race yes. but a process yes. having a destination it's ought to be reframed I mean, it, and, and that doesn't mean that there aren't moments where we reflect and sort of understand within ourselves that we have accomplished um, something great but it aren't it aren't to be seen as the destination at least yes. for ourselves and for the development of our minds if we have a destination or getting a degree is where we finish learning or finishing our masters is where we finish learning then we have to rethink that mental structure because yes. It, 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 like businesses, it's going to lead to us losing a lot of value in the marketplace. Yes, yes. Because we have so arrived. True, yes. And mm. it's a ladder you're climbing. When you conquer a wrong, you move to another one and you start over again. So, Room for... As you said... Hmm? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead please. Room for disappointment. Yeah. As a leader, and you're creating, you're responsible for the environment that you're operating. I always am of the idea that as a leader, one of your main responsibility is managing the environment or creating the environment that the team operates in. And, and that environment has to be sort of dealt with, with as a home, as a community, as a society. It really needs care. And you mentioned something, um, and I would like to hear how you think about it. It is leaving room for disappointment. Have you ever been really yes. and truly disappointed? Um before in a, in a team that you've been on and, and, and how, how did you think of that? Do you have an example there? Kind of putting you on the spot. Many, yes, many a times. And it is part of the pathway. Because let me just go back to this and I use an illustration first and then we can come back. I look at how Jesus picked his team. The people with the greatest responsibility were the ones who disappointed him most. But mm. what he was, what I saw from that, what I'm learning from that, is that it's a part of the process. Judas, who betrayed him, was so important that if Judas did not do what he was supposed to do, the work would not have been completed. Mm. So we can get emotional that we don't want the Judases in our team, but they are an important part of the selection. 
<laughs> ding, 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 ding. Hold on. So, let's pause. Yes. <laughs> let's pause and rethink. Let's think about what, what was just said. Are you saying that while we are developing our team, it's also important to have the Judases on our team? Definitely. And this is the hardest thing to embrace. But they have the most important job. Because if Jesus had stepped away from the cross, we'd have no salvation. So Judas had such a major role to play. When Judas came, Jesus said, friend, do what you have to do. So it was not a mistake to put a Judas on the team. Well, we tend to want to eliminate the Judases. So we want, to, we want to boycott the process of moving to the next level. We want to eliminate the Peters. Because Peter who denied Jesus three times. When before the crucifixion, Jesus was specific. He said to Peter, Simon, Simon, the devil decided to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail him. But Peter had such an important part of the process that Peter had to learn through disappointing him and failing him how important his work was. So as a leader, if Jesus did not leave room for Peter to fail and to hurt him, but that is part of the learning for Peter too, he would not have been the, the leader that he was. Because he said, Peter, see if us upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Mm. So Jesus did not pray that Peter would not disappoint him. But he would pray that beyond the disappointment, Peter would recognize and now go back to strengthen his brothers. So part of leadership is to create that room, that space for others to fail and get up and learn in without holding it against them because it is part of the process. And that's that the learn, that's space. The, people learning. the unlearned space. <laughs> mm. You take over, Jim. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, include the Judas in our team. Yes. Um, <laughs> eliminate the Peter, which in that aspect of the process, um, that the role that Peter played, um excellent because it is in those moments um and and i really like the prayer that jesus prayed yes because it, it it's it speaks so much volume of the type of leader so much about the type of leader jesus was the greatest leader ever to walk there and he really never asked Peter not to disappoint what he really asked was unlearn relearn and get stronger <laughs> wow <laughs> that's a revelation Jamie <laughs> I, I'm amazed by that and, and I think it's a quality that is difficult to develop it's a role as a leader, uh, uh, as leaders. And I mean, we all are leaders, right? We lead in some way, form, or shape. In our homes, at work, whether we are riding the public transport, whether we are in our communities, um, even we lead in our own lives. Yes. And it's the ability to create space even within our own selves for our own selves to disappoint our own selves to be wow. disappointed to fail that's powerful and understand this I, I, and again this is the room and the space for disappointment is quite important but i think where the gem is is understanding and learning about the process of disappointment in itself. Meaning, when I'm disappointed, 
to be affected by disappointment and to use it as fuel into the other processes of unlearning and relearning. And I think if you to, 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 to mix the two where we enter into with our team um, the, the idea of disappointed being I am going to be disappointed throughout this process. You are going to be disappointed. Let us know. Be disappointed. Feel disappointed. Embrace the disappointment. Deal with the disappointment together and by ourselves, within and out of ourselves. And then use the disappointment to fuel unlearning and relearning. Not to dismiss the disappointment. That's where I want to get at.